So some people say that tool makers are a stodgy group of people, and I don't agree with that. Uh, we do have a sense of humor. And, uh, you know, yeah, we're the Midwestern people. We pay our taxes. We do all that stuff. But, you know, we do like life. And we're going to break some new ground here. We're going to take a different approach to explaining something as simple as what we call the lowly micrometer because it's been around so long. Uh, we want to prove that education can be fun. So we're going to inject uh, a little bit of humor to provide the education and, and make it fun for those of you out there that are going to be watching. So let's take a look. The lowly micrometer. We have a very, very special guest today that we're going to bring in here that is one of the kind of the co-inventor of the micrometer. And we're happy to have this guy because he's going to tell us about the history of the micrometer. And I want you to please welcome Mr. Gaskin, uh, guess one, guess, guess one. Anyway, please welcome him. Hi, it's been a long journey. And thank you for having me, but get the name straight, it's Garcoin. So William Garcon, uh, Garcia, whatever. Uh, but by the way, welcome. Uh, we're, we're glad to have you here in our studio. And uh, tell me, where, where were you born? Ah, Middleton, Leeds, you know. It's in Great Britain. Been there? Great country, you know. So, are we out of questions? <laughs> If that's it, I can leave, you know. <laughs> Mr. Garcon, uh, when were you born? Garcoin, Garcoin, Garcoin. Get the friggin' name straight. Last I can remember was 1612, but it's been a while ago, you know. So, Mr. Uh, Garconi, uh, how did you invent the micrometer? Can you tell us about that? It was me and a spider. Spider sat down beside her. No, actually, Spider put a little web right down there in between my lenses, and I was gazing at the stars one day, and I looked up, and I saw that star, and I was trying to figure out how to measure the thickness one side to another. So long and short of it is, I put a screw down here with a thread in it, you know, and I could turn the thread sort of like a micrometer, and that's how we got the micrometer. That was the beginning of it. So what you're saying is you didn't invent the first handheld micrometer. Who did? Well, the first handheld micrometer was invented by Jean Laurent Palmer. So Jean Laurent Palmer was the inventor of the first handheld micrometer. So if I understand that right. Uh, when did he do that? That was in 1848. Is that it? Mr. Gargone. Gargoyne. Why do you call it a micrometer? Why not an inchometer or an inchometer or a micrometer or something else? But why a micrometer? Why do you call it that? Ask the bloody Yanks. They're the ones that copied it. We, we, we talked about calling it a bunch of things. Inchometer, inchometer, micrometer, micrometer. Seems to me that micrometer sounds pretty good. In fact, if you look back today, it's the same name we're using today. Could have used it back then too, just as easily. Don't know why we didn't. So can you tell us, when did it go into production so the masses could buy it? When did that happen? It went into production in, in 1867. Brown and Sharp was the first to make it available to the public at large. So every toolmaker could have one because they were mass producing them and it was the best thing that I ever invented. So uh, great to have you here, uh, Mr. Uh, Garconi, and uh, have a safe trip back. And uh, Garcoin, Garcoin, you can't get the bloody name straight, you wanker. Uh, we hope to see you here again sometime, and uh, it's been a lot of fun. And uh, so uh, let's get back to this. Well, that was an interesting interview. Um, guy's a character, you know. I'm glad he went back to where he came from. I mean, the guy was, by the way, you know, I think he invented that when uh, that he was only 18 years old when he when he came up with that idea, you know, with the with the crosshairs. Pretty cool stuff. So the anatomy of a of the lowly micrometer. Well, 
you know, you're never really going to know how to use it properly and to take good care of it if you don't understand the anatomy of it. So basically somebody, what, what he came up with was the idea of a screw. That's really what Garcoin came up with. This particular screw that we have on a micrometer has 40 threads per inch, which means 40 turns will give you an inch. Therefore, if we take an inch and if we divide it into 1,000 parts and we make one turn, we have 25 thousandths. If we make four turns, we have 100 thousandths. We make, uh, we make 40 turns, we have an inch. So that's one level of, of measurement. The second one is on the tumbler, which has graduations totaling 25. So if you were to move it one full turn, Glenn, what do you think? If we moved it one full turn, you'd have what, 25, right? Yeah. And what if I moved it over past the 25 and went to 10? We'd have what? 35. Correct and so forth. So that's the next level of graduation. But there's also one more. If you look at each graduation, and again, there's 25 to a turn, we look at each one, and if we could divide that 10 times, do you know what we'd have then? Um, Not a fair question. No. <laughs> you'd, have, you'd have one ten thousandth of an inch, or a tenth. Because now we're going to take that inch and we're going to divide it, not just a thousand times, we're going to divide it 10,000 times. But how would we measure that with a micrometer? Well, it's, it's, it's pretty hard to do, but with a little bit of finesse, you can do it. I can measure within a tenth all day long, and so can many other tool guys. So one of the keys is you've got to have a good micrometer. This one, for example, is not really what I would consider high quality for a lot of reasons, but this one has shake in there, which is not good. So this is the micrometer that when I was a toolmaker, this is the guy I would loan out. These were mine, set to my feel. I don't want anybody touching them, and I don't want to be a bad guy, so I bought four of these all the way up to four inches. So if somebody wanted to borrow a mic, I'd say they're right over there in a the drawer. So, for example, Fred, Fred would call me and say, hey, Bailey, I need to borrow a micrometer. I'd say, okay, Fred, here you go. End of that micrometer, right? So I don't know if you can see. Glenn, can you get a close up of this? There are lines here amounting to 10 lines. And if you were to divide this one thousandths and move it over each one of these lines, and line it up. If you lined it up with the second one, that would be two tenths. The third one would be three tenths and so forth. So going back to the anatomy of it, there's also a slip clutch here, which allows the user to put a certain amount of pressure on whatever it is that they might be measuring. So for example, if we're gonna measure this, you could use a slip clutch. And frankly, I don't like it. That's my view on it. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Holding it might seem awkward in the beginning, but this is the way you hold it, folks. It's easy, and you get used to it. It's pretty safe. You can rotate the tumbler here, and you've got a good grip on it here. And as far as opening it up, say you want to open it up to three quarters of the way, save a little time, just run it up and down your arm. And when you're going back, you sure want to be careful that you don't jam it all the way down. So when you get close, you stop. That's two ways to handle it appropriately. So what I really like about using a micrometer is I want the feel. And again, this is, this is really a touch, man. I mean, this is something that, this goes into art form. This is not just being a tool maker. This is, this is it, it gets out of that realm of measuring and it goes into being art. You know, there's a big difference between uh, being a mechanic and being an artistic mechanic. And I don't mean an auto mechanic. Mechanic to me means anything that's mechanically, uh, uh, yeah, that's mechanical, it's out there that you're, you know, you're working on. I don't care if it's an air conditioner or if it's a die. Something else, this particular micrometer does not have carbide tips. 
This one does. Why are they important? A couple of reasons. First of all, carbide tips give you a completely different feel when you're measuring something than do steel tips. More importantly, they wear longer. They last a long time. So, carbide tips are critical in measuring. And having a good tumbler with a good smooth roll to it is very important. There's a lock here that you can lock it down if you choose to, which is not a bad idea. For example, if I wanted to measure this in two or three spots, I could feel it the way it should be and lock it, and then I can roll it in. And this happens to be off. This thing is worn big time. Look at that. This thing's worn about half a thousandths. Huh. And that's why there's a little shake in here, too. So, that's part of the anatomy of it. Using a micrometer is very, very important that you keep the, the uh, anvils clean, the anvil and the spindle. What I do, and some people don't like to do it, but I'm sorry folks, I do it on paper. I just run it in there very gently and slide it off. That cleans it. I've got a good solid feel there now. This micrometer, for my feel, is on zero, and that's the way I feel it. So you need to get used to that. That is so important. That touch is so critical. And once you get that feel, it's, it's you'd be surprised. With a good set of micrometers like this, and these are Etalons, I don't even know if they make them anymore. But once you get the feel of that, you too can read within a tenth or two. Here's the challenge. Supposing we want to measure this bearing race, which happens to be four inches. Now this is not easy to do. You might think that it is, but one of the challenges that you have in, in measuring it is getting it, A, to the largest part of the diameter, and what's important about that, also, you are going to have to go back and forth to the right and to the left to make sure that you're parallel. That will make all the difference in the world in making sure that you measure it properly. So, there, and I'm comfortable with that. It's just a nice slip feel. And when you feel that, you know that you've got it this way. See, there's just a little bit of play in there. When you hear that squeak, you know you're there. That's perfection. And I don't know if you can see that, but that's exactly four inches. So the squeak tells you a lot. You're not going to get that squeak <clears throat> unless you have carbide tips. So what happens if you drop this thing? Boing! If you bend this, now it's no longer parallel to the tumbler side. What do you do then? That's why I don't like to loan my mics out. Because I don't know if the guy dropped it. I'm going to give it to this guy and say, here you go, Fred, go ahead and use it. And he gives it back to me. And now it doesn't work right. What did he do to it? The only thing you can do if that happens, you're going to have to send them out to a lab. And they will lap these back in to get them parallel again. That's a real, that's a real problem. So my recommendation is if you really want to learn how to read mics that accurately, with the feel and the squeak. Don't loan them out to anybody. You don't have to be a nasty guy or a bad guy. I mean, I again, I never liked to do that. That's why I always had two sets of mics. I had one that nobody, I didn't want anybody to touch them because I want to make sure that when I, when I read something and I want to know that it's within a tenth or two and I don't have any other way to measure it. Now, there's other ways to do it, but if I didn't have any other ways to measure it, I'm going to use my micrometer and I want to make sure that when I put it away, 
that it was in the same condition that I put it away when I got it today. I want to. I don't. I don't know that if I loan it to somebody. So and frankly, I never ask anybody to borrow their tools. I always went out of my way, and I was fortunate enough to be able to buy enough tools so I didn't have to borrow. So if you do borrow them, you know, be careful. Again, it's easier for me just to say, here you go, use these, Fred. So that's kind of the art form of reading a micrometer within a tenth, and you can do it. But again, it's all in that feel. Another thing is, we didn't talk about this. Why is this plastic here? Do you know why that's on there, Glenn? No. Wait, wait. Static electricity? Close. Heat from your hand. Huh. The heat from your hand will cause this to expand, and it'll grow. You'll get a false reading. That's why you'll see, even on this one, but it's more important, if it grows, say, a tenth per inch, you got a four-inch micrometer here, it's going to grow four tenths. This is not quite as critical. If it grows a tenth, it grows a tenth. It's, you know, it's one inch maximum. The heat does that for The heat from your hand will cause it to grow. But isn't it like forged steel? Doesn't matter. Steel expands. Hmm. So that's why you'll see on, on really good mics, you'll see the insulator on here. So the heat from your hand is still going to get in there, but not anywhere like it could. So remember, good micrometer, carbide tips, good feel, don't loan them out, you don't need to use the clutch, generate a feel. You'll love it and you're going to take it to the next level which is art form. And thanks for watching.